will we begin by stating that there are many informative videos on YouTube about the American Revolution. However, I have yet to find one solely focused on the methodology and strategies in funding and financing this rebellion. The American Revolution is another chapter in history of man versus their master. The struggle for freedom and the pursuit of liberty and happiness. This documentary is intended for an audience that already understands the causes, consequences, and outcomes of the revolution. And I will mainly focus on the economic conditions, financing, and other relevant material for funding the revolution. After the Battle of Lexington and Concord and the Declaration of Independence from Britain, the Continental Congress was presented with many issues that a new and hastily organized government could barely solve. Following the first engagements with the British military, the Continental Congress took the task of administering and financing the rebellion. Initially, state governments were required to provide soldiers, money, and other material in the conflict. However, there was little incentive to meet quotas, and many states fell short in supporting the war. Congress realized that enforcing this type of taxation was unpopular and ineffective, given the time they had to prepare and the limited scope of government operations. However, Congress improvised by issuing the first continental dollar to pay for war debt. As long as merchants, bankers, and soldiers would accept the money based on the reputation and goodwill of Congress, the dollar would be valued. Congress also issued war bonds, received loans from France, and lastly, when all other sources were exhausted, Congress turned a blind eye to extortion, theft, and liquidation of assets of those unwilling to lend and give Congress and the Army food and supplies. The Continental Dollar issued by Congress allowed the government to buy desperately needed material for the Army, pay salaries, and debts. However, the dollar was doomed since its inception. Congress produced too many notes and the dollar began to fall in value. Along with steady pressure from counterfeiting operations in Boston, the dollar fell from par to 0.25 specie to 1 and near the closing of the conflict became completely worthless. The American Congress wasn't the only one in financial trouble. The British government had the largest public debt in its history due to the French and Indian War. King George relied heavily on his dominion over Hanover and its landgrave of Hesse Castle, Frederick II. He was known for his ruthlessness and willingness to lend out his Hessian soldiers to the highest bidder. The limited success of establishing a revenue source for war expenditures still required a substantial resources to fit, clothe, and arm, and feed the Continental Army and state militias. The Army was frequently plagued by shortages of war-related resources, hindering its performance and longevity in the field due to administrative incompetence, logistical obstacles, and corruption. Establishing a supply line for a campaign was very costly, and at times impossible due to geographic boundaries. In some instances, contracted transportation costs were as high as 15% of the goods bought. Subsequently, state militias were required to provide provisions for themselves while marching to their rendezvous and were promised to be paid the subsistence rate for food by Congress. However, when reaching their destinations, it was more than common to find that the, uh, find that the state militias were without food or shelter. Many designated commissaries representing their militias wrote to Congress for immediate supplies or funds to discourage mutiny and starvation. During the course of their departure, militiamen usually starved and returning home plundered out of desperation making no distinction between enemy and foe. The mobilization and supply was never a master policy during the war that ensured that prolonged usefulness and combat effectiveness of state militias. In 1780, 17,325 militia were raised for a spring offensive by the recommendation of General Washington. After receiving much less than expected, the remainder disbanded due to the lack of supplies. Washington wrote, They never rendered a day's service that might be called useful. This venture alone cost Congress $77,962, and, and the militia that were successfully raised became disillusioned with their service. In rare cases, Congress granted sums of money to the commissaries to pay for militia expenses, but most of the time they issued certificates and promises of payment for goods rendered. Continental money was received in compensation for individual militiamen's expenses months late. 
and almost completely worthless in transaction. Orders were issued to pay the militia seven shillings and six pence a week for subsistence. However, neither the state or Congress knew who would assume the responsibility of payment. Delays in procuring provisions and payment to the militia exhausted expectations and forced those who relied on the government promises to return home or starve. By failing to secure a steady flow of revenue into government coffers to pay for the revolution, desperation began to set in. In the early stages of the conflict, individuals were targeted for being Tories or loyal to Great Britain. Their land, assets, and personal possessions were seized by governments or carried off in mobs of patriots. An unintended consequence for these actions gave birth to the nation of Canada, where many United Loyalists sought British protection and settled in Upper and Lower Canada. However, later in the conflict, this policy could no longer spare their ordinary citizens. Ill-equipped, undernourished, and exhausted armies from both sides ravaged the countryside in search for food and supplies. Many merchants, innkeepers, and businessmen were forced at gunpoint to relinquish their stores for the Continental Army and offer government-issued money or certificates that yielded little value. Particularly distressing, many American merchants were seized after suspicion and eyewitness accounts of artificially imp inflating prices to oncoming armies that needed supply. Many American merchants also traded valuable commodities and material to the British Army that paid in hard currency. The true nature of capitalism isn't without its drawbacks, and quoting a similar movie, you're not a true internationalist until you've supplied arms to kill your own countrymen, in which many Americans at this time fit the criteria. In many respects, the American Revolution was completely homegrown and received little outside aid and support. Using their own domestic economy, manpower, and human capital, the young American nation fought the British to a standstill and endured until the British realized that independence was inevitable. The common American culture so often taken for granted is the spawn of this revolution. The free spirit, anti-government, and pro-individuality, the right to bear arms and defend one's home, the right to speak out and pursue one's dreams and aspirations, was a flavor never tasted by the world, which was still dominated by a concentrated aristocracy. This is why still to this day the world looks to America as not only the most powerful nation on earth, but an example for all countries to follow, at least until Wall Street stole the economy. The purpose of this video is to inform on the methods of financing the war. However, the message that all viewers should take away is that the revolutionary Americans forfeited their lives, happiness, and personal wealth for a cause that was a breath away from being quelled and forgotten. Like all children throughout history, we have taken for granted the purpose and mission of the revolution and have become too comfortable allowing its purpose to become perverted. The question I leave you with, how many of you would be willing to risk everything for the freedom and happiness of others? If you can't answer this question or fail to understand it, you're not an American.